Hello, everybody, on this uh, very solemn occasion. Um, before I welcome our, our, our wonderful speakers and, and thank them very much for joining us, I'd like to um, have a minute of silence um, for all of our brothers and sisters who were lost on October 7th and afterwards. Um, and Jackie's going to um, run a screen, uh, a screen share um, with many of the name uh, with the names of uh, those who were lost. Hello, everybody. On this uh, very solemn occasion, um, before I welcome our 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 wonderful speakers and and thank them very much for joining us, I'd like to um, have a minute of silence um, for all of our brothers and sisters who were lost on October seventh and afterwards. Um, and Jackie's going to. Um, run a screen uh, a screen share um with many of the name of with the names of uh, those who were lost Thank, thank you, everyone. If she can, Jackie's going to try to run that in the background, um, but she's also going to put the, um, this is from the ministry, the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs. She'll also put the link in so that all of you can read uh, read the names um, today or in the future and, you know, what happened to each of them um, in, the, you know, in the horrible on October 7th. Um, I would first like to introduce uh, Dana Luz. Um, and uh, Dan is a, uh, you know, longtime friend of ZOA. Uh, he was, in fact, the director of, of our Israel office um, for several years, and now he's a member of the Knesset. Um, he's a member of uh, it's the important committees and uh, that, that, that deal with these issues. And uh, he speaks on, in the media in defense of Israel. Um, while he was at ZOA, Dan and I co-authored um, some of the uh, materials that you see and the resources on the ZOA website about important issues. And uh, I'd like to um, just have Dan, please go ahead. Thanks. Thank you, Liz. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Jerusalem. And I think that one year after uh, what happened on October 7th, uh, it's a good time now to take a uh, little moment and remember what happened on this horrendous day. Uh, even if uh, we all know already, it's important to repeat these things from time to time in order not to forget them. Uh, so on October 7th, we saw the face of pure evil revealed to us. Uh, Hamas in an unprovoked attack, uh, went into Israel. And not only did they kill a large number of Jews, the largest number of Jews that were killed since the Holocaust, but the methods that they used showed us their true evil spirit. We're talking about babies that were burnt alive, women that were raped and paraded around the streets of Gaza, families that were killed one in front of the other in their own homes. And I think that the most horrid part of this all, and everything I said was already horrid, but the most horrendous thing is that they filmed this whole thing and broadcasted it live as if they were, not as if, because they were so proud of what they were doing. Now, when we saw this in Israel, we understood that we had only one option, and that was to get into a very long, difficult, and serious war with the goal of eradicating this evil that was revealed on this day. And that's what we've been doing ever since. The reason why we had to go into this war is, first of all, is in order to give a clear message to terrorist groups all around the world, that this is not something that you can do and get away with. 
In other words, if a group like Hamas can do these horrendous things and then survive and continue, maybe they'll get hit, but they'll survive, rebuild, and then do this again. It not only is a danger because Hamas is a danger, it's a danger also because it gives a message to terrorist groups all around the world that they can do these things, survive, and then do them over and over and over again. And Hamas would become an inspiration for terrorist groups all around the world, not only against Israel, by the way, but against the free world as a whole. But there's also a deeper reason, which isn't just security-wise. It's also very deep into Israeli consciousness and goes into the very foundation of what Zionism is. When Zionism was created, there were many streams of Zionism around. There was religious Zionism, political Zionism, revisionist Zionism, social Zionism. They all had their own ideology. But one thing that united all of them is that they all spoke about the need for Israel that was to be created to be a place where Jews could defend themselves, where Jews could be safe, where Jews would not be attacked by anti-Semitism anymore. Now, after the Holocaust, the biggest slogan of the Jewish world, and even beyond the Jewish world, became never again. And the biggest embodiment of this slogan was the state of Israel and the IDF that was created. We understood that if we could defend ourselves and had our own state, then something like the Holocaust wouldn't be able to happen again. Now, on October 7th, this was challenged because never again happened again. It happened for only one day. It's not the same thing. It happened for one day, and it's not that the same day happened over and over and, uh, and over again for years. But still, we got a taste of what the Holocaust was. And now, after October 7th, this is when we're tested. When we said never again, did we actually mean it? Or was it only a slogan? Because things, tragedies like October 7th can happen. But our response to it then defines if when we said never again, did we actually mean it? Or was it just a slogan that we said? Now, since October 7th, I want to tell you, the Israeli army has been doing incredible work. It's been a very difficult war. We lost a lot of very courageous soldiers, but we've also had a lot, a lot of accomplishments. I think that in the last few weeks only, uh, we can see how many accomplishments we've had militarily on both fronts, in Gaza, in Lebanon, and we're also gearing up uh, to respond uh, to what has uh, been an, a, a, a very serious attack from Iran. As our prime minister has already said, it will not go uh, without a, a strong response. Now, while we're fighting this war, and as we said, we're fighting the war that's not just our war, but it's the war of the free world. Unfortunately, uh, we see that a lot of the institutions and countries that should be standing by us are not necessarily doing this. And I, I want to speak about two patterns that I've seen since October 7. One is the call to create a Palestinian state as the way to get out of this conflict that started on October 7. This recent conflict, the conflict is much older, but I'm say, talking about this recent, uh, this recent uh, manifestation of this conflict. Now, this is ridiculous, not only because creating a Palestinian state is always a bad idea, and it's always a bad idea, but creating a Palestinian state after October 7th, that's basically telling terrorists, here, you used violence, you made a massacre, let me give you a prize. It's basically telling terrorists all around the world that if they do things like rape women, burn babies alive, and abduct elderly, that they can get diplomatic gains. This is something we cannot allow to happen. And that's why in the Knesset, we passed a resolution with both coalition and opposition, including people who sometimes disagree with me on the Palestinian state issue. 
but they say right now, after October 7th, are you insane? This would be a complete disaster. The second thing I, I, I see is a lot of the institutions that are supposed to uh, safeguard international law, such as the ICJ, the ICC, and other inst institutions like this are being used against Israel. Now, this isn't new. It's lawfare. But when we're talking right now about using these institutions against Israel, the country that follows international law more than any other country in the world, and we're targeting that country and saying, basically, you're not allowed to defend yourself. We're saying, basically, when Hamas uses civilians as human shields, that gives them immunity. We're saying all of these different messages that are coming out of international law, you know what that makes? That ends up making international law irrelevant. These institutions are shooting themselves in the foot because they're making international law irrelevant because I don't know any country that would commit suicide just in order to be seen as the nice guy that follows international law. We in Israel definitely do not intend to do that. We understand in Israel that it's much more important to be alive than to be popular. And so we'll keep on doing the right thing. We'll keep on defending our people and ensuring that in all of these different fronts, uh, we're going to bring victory uh, to our people. Now, I want to end with one small note. We're in a very, very important point in Israeli history. We're in a point with two different paths that are very clearly open to us. One path, is a path for the Middle East with emboldened terrorists, with a stronger Iran that might get nuclear weapons, with more and more October 7th, more and more tragedies, more and more of these things happening over and over again. And it's a very, very dark path, first for the Middle East, and then it's going to spread over to the whole world. But there's another path, and that's the one we're building right now, and our soldiers are the ones building them right now. It's a path that sees cooperation. It's a path that if, if I had to give it a name, it would be Abraham Accords because it, that's where the seeds were, were, were basically planted. It's a path which sees cooperation, trade, uh, different countries that used to be enemies but that now are cooperating from Israel all the way to uh, Saudi Arabia and even beyond because it goes to the east. It's a path of economic growth, and I believe that the fights that we are fighting right now, our goal shouldn't just be to hit Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon. Our goal should be to keep fighting until we defeat all of the enemies of freedom in Lebanon and ensure that we can, because in Lebanon we do have different factions, including some that have potential of being allies if they're not within the control of Hezbollah uh, or threatened by Hezbollah. And so we should keep fighting until we allow these, uh, these factions uh, to get the possibility to stand up and to, be a, 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 to go from the Iranian axis to the Abraham Accords axis. Same thing in Gaza. Same thing in every single front that we're, uh, we're fighting. Our goal needs to be to reverse the Iranian strategy, uh, strategy that has started in the 1980s, where Iran has slowly, slowly taken more and more proxies that have acted for them in different places, and to just chip them away from Iran and to bring them on the side of good, take them away from the side of evil and bring them to the side of good. I believe that what our soldiers are doing right now is something which is absolutely incredible. It's historic. It will change the Middle East. And the way the Middle East will look after this war, if we win and we will win, uh, will be much better with much more optimism and with uh, much less strength to all of these evil powers uh, that have built their strength in the past few decades. Now, I already went over time, so I'll let Liz uh, introduce the next speaker, but I'm staying on the call. Thank, thank, thank you so much, Dan. Thank, thank you. And you know, you, you just once again demonstrated why we at ZOA and all of our friends are so proud of you and so proud of the work you're doing in the Knesset and defending Israel on the international stage. Really, that was that was just a tre tremendous. And we also so so thankful uh, about the uh, Knesset 
uh, passing the resolution against unanimously, except for nine people from the Arab parties, uh, against the Palestinian state. And I think that's a perfect segue um, to speak with Nadia Matar, who has been fighting this fight for so long and is a longtime good friend of ZOA. Um, Nadia made Elias a, a teenager. She's a very well-known activist, mother of six children, co-chair of the strong pro-Israel group, Women in Green. Uh, she lives in Efrat in the Judean hills, where uh, also, you know, others, other ZOA leaders and friends who made Aliyah live. Um, and uh, like ZOA, she was a, f a strong opponent of the Oslo Accords um, and the disaster of Israel leaving Gaza, Gaza which we unfortunately now, you know, see the, the, the fruit, we saw the fruits of on uh, October 7th. Um, Nadia, please, uh, please go ahead. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Liz. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. So Shalom, Shana Tova, and thank you. Uh, thank you, Mort Klein, for inviting us. Thank you for all the wonderful work you and ZOA do for Israel and the Jewish people. I represent here my co-chair, Yehudit Katzover, who is the mastermind behind the sovereignty movement. When already in 2011, she rightfully said that it is not enough to say no to a Palestinian state, which we know is the end of Israel as a Jewish state, but the national camp needs to present an alternative, which we believe has to be the application of Israeli sovereignty over the land of Israel. Jewish settlement is important, but it is not enough to keep the land in our hands, as we saw in 2005 in the disengagement. Mort, you asked that on this difficult day of October 7th, exactly a year after the genocidal massacre by Arabs of so many Jews, that we talk about the cause, the meaning, and implications. To put it simply, the cause, lack of Israeli sovereignty. The meaning, Israel must and will, please God, restore its strength and deterrence through sovereignty, and I will explain. The implication, when Israel, please God, will restore its sovereignty and will implement it from the river to the sea, Israeli sovereignty, including Gaza and in Lebanon, at least till the Litani, then there will be a new Middle, Middle East and Israel will have saved Western civilization from itself. Yes, this war is not only about Israel's survival, as Dan Ilus just said correctly, but the survival of Western civilization. The powers of evil that Israel is at war with on seven different fronts, Gaza, Lebanon, Iraq, Yemen, Judea, Samaria, and of course, Iran, are powers that have as a slogan, and I translate from the Arabic, on Saturdays, we will kill the Jews. On Sundays, we will kill the Christians. In other words, we first will destroy Israel and then go on to destroy Europe and turn it into Arabia, onto America, etc. Step one to destroy Israel is to call for the creation of a Palestinian state whose entire purpose is Israel's destruction. Let's make things clear. Anyone in favor of a Palestinian state is in favor of the destruction of Israel. And thus, anyone who wants Western civilization to survive must oppose the creation of a Palestinian state and must allow Israel to reach complete victory. And victory over these powers will be Israeli sovereignty over its God-given biblical homeland. Sovereignty means that Israel, the nation state of the Jewish people, will proudly declare this land is ours and only ours, given to us by God, or as Ben-Gurion said, the Bible is our mandate. True, international law is also on our side. And never again will we give up not even one inch to any foreign ruler, not to the terrorist Palestinian Authority that needs to be dismantled, not the anti-Semitic European Union, nor any so-called moderate Arab countries like the Emirates or Saudi with whom we have to be careful. Yes, we can make business deals with them. We can make cooperation with them, but we cannot allow them to have any say or stronghold in our land. Israel must be the sole sovereign over its land, its weapon industry, its agriculture, its economy. This year, we suffered a severe and painful blow. But thank God the people of Israel have risen courageously like lions to strike the enemy. Thousands of Israeli heroes and heroines, the amazing soldiers, the amazing wives and families of the soldiers, the amazing skills of the IDF, the Mossad, that stunned the world. Thanks to all these, we see that Hamas is pleased God on its way to being destroyed. Hopefully Hezbollah will soon be too. In Iran, they don't sleep very well. And we pray that this government will not stop until complete victory. But we must ask, what are the lessons that we learned and what needs to be done? Lesson number one, we learned the hard way to know who our neighbors are. I purposely use the word, the massacre by Arabs, and I don't say by Hamas, because the beheading, the raping, the killing, the stabbing, the burning of Jews, 
was not only done by Hamas terrorists in uniform with army weapons, but by civilians of the entire population of Gaza, those who the Jews of the South allowed to enter their homes, who had coffee with them, uh, those Arabs who worked in the Jewish kibbutzim and were given good conditions and salaries. These same Arabs committed the crimes, young and old, came to butcher the Jews, to behead Jewish babies with shovels, sticks, knives, Young Arab men called up their mommy and cheered that their hands were dipping in Jewish blood and their mothers praised them and urged them to continue. Not only in Gaza, the Arabs of Judea and Samaria overwhelmingly supported the crimes and teach their children to go in that same direction. These are people who have been taught since they were born that it is a holy commandment to kill Jews and those who kill Jews go to heaven and their families receive great stipends. Any capitulation on our part is seen as weakness and only increases their appetite. Lesson number two, the only way that they will not kill the Jews is if we stop talking French or Yiddish and start talking Arabic, i.e. if we make sure we are strong and if we make sure that they don't get motivation nor means nor weapons to kill and that when they try that the price is so high for them that they will not dare do it again for hundreds of years. Lesson number three, what happened that enabled them to commit these horrors? We, Israel, are at fault. We enabled that monster to grow. For Israel made a fatal mistake in 1967 when we won the Six Day War, Israel did not include the liberated areas into official Israel. Instead of applying sovereignty, it left a vacuum. Luckily, a group of heroic Jews took the initiative and founded the settlement movement, convincing the different governments to recreate Jewish communities and Jewish life in our biblical heartland. Thanks to these pioneers, we are close to 1 million Jews in these areas. But what hasn't changed? The legal status of the area. There still is no sovereignty in Judea, Samaria, and the Jordan Valley. When Israel doesn't apply its sovereignty, it passes on the message that it is not sure it is ours forever. Not applying sovereignty gives the Arabs hope that they can still steal our land and gives them motivation to continue with terror. By not applying sovereignty, we allow the lie to grow of an inventor Palestinian people that falsely claims this land is theirs. When Israel doesn't apply its sovereignty, the world sees us as an occupier. Because Israel did not apply its sovereignty, it opened the way to plans that try to solve the conflict. That is how the horrendous Oslo Accords came into the world in 1993 with Chamberlain-like Israeli leaders who foolishly believed the murder of Yasser Arafat and his false promises and gave him weapons, ammunition, and parts of our homeland. The Oslo Accords brought upon us not only 1,500 Jews murdered in the 90s, but also brought upon us the massacre of October 7th, of course also after the disengagement or the expulsion of Jews from Gush Katif in 2005. In conclusion, a military victory of Israel over Hamas, Hezbollah, and Iran is crucial, but not enough. This war is about the battle of Israel for its survival and for the survival of Western civilization. This war is about sovereignty. Who will be sovereign in this world? The powers of light or the powers of darkness? The powers of morality or the powers of immorality? We are happy more and more people join the sovereignty call and vision, including Ambassador David Friedman with his new book and plan, because of the many challenges, we all understand that it needs to be done in stages. Our movement calls, our sovereignty movement calls for the urgent application of sovereignty over the Jordan Valley first. And we are very happy that Dan Iluz heads together with MK uh, Tayeb and uh, Amita Levy, the lobby for the sovereignty over the Jordan Valley first. Dan, we soon are going to have a trip there with you. It's Israel Eastern border. Iran is using it to infiltrate murderers and weapons that must stop. There are very few Arabs there. There's a large consensus about it in Israel, on the right and on the left, that the Jordan Valley needs to be under Israeli sovereignty. It will enable investors to invest and build large Jewish cities some 30 minutes from the Dan area. And most importantly, it will finally prevent the creation of a Palestinian state. Application of sovereignty will be parallel to a military victory. Application of sovereignty will be the diplomatic, political knockout blow to our enemies and the cherry on the Sunday of victory. Let us finish with a prayer to the Almighty that he grants us victory over our enemies, the safe return of our hostages from captivity, the security and well-being of our soldiers, 
the return of the displaced residents of the North and the South to their homes, unity for our nation, and Israeli sovereignty over the entire land of Israel. Am Yisrael Chai, Shana Tova, Gmar Chatima Tova. Am Yisrael Chai, thank you so much for those truly inspiring words, Nadia. Very much appreciated, very much appreciated. Um, like, I'd like to now um, uh, introduce Dr. Sebastian Gorka. Um, Dr. Gorka is a media host and commentator on Newsmax and, and radio, uh, radio host. Um, he's a counterterrorism expert. He was, he was deputy president, uh, deputy assistant to the president and, and a strategist in the Trump administration and a member of the National Security Education Board. Um, his parents were from Hungary and his father uh, stood up against both the Nazis to help his Jewish neighbors and stood up against the communists. And we are very honored uh, to have him here. And uh, he is another good friend of the ZOA. Dr. Gorka. Thank you kindly. It's an uh, honor to be here. I don't see my buddy Mort, but hopefully uh, we'll get him on my radio show uh, later today. I'm not sure what, what I can add to what's already been said or what will come after me, because I think everybody on this call understands the enormity of the last 12 months, understands the really existential threat not only Israel faces, but the whole of Judeo-Christian civilization. If uh, my former boss isn't re-elected into the White House on November the 5th, things could be even worse than they already are. It is a statement of empirical fact that President Trump was the most philo-Semitic uh, head of state for the United States since the rebirth of Israel in 1948. I, I, you know, I try to tell uh, Jewish Americans, do you, do you understand that, that every president from Clinton through Bush, through Obama, uh, had promised to move the embassy and recognize Jerusalem, but betrayed our friends in the Middle East? And it was only President Trump against the majority of his cabinet, only three members of his cabinet supported him, who said, after 23 years, we're doing it because we promised the people of Israel, I promised the people of America during the campaign, and thirdly, because it is the right thing to do. Um, why was there peace for four years? Why were there no new wars? Why did we have the Abraham Accords? Because President Trump understands that we are in a civilizational war, uh, against barbarism. The people responsible for September the 11th, the people responsible for what happened on October the 7th are the same. Uh, as our first, I think it was our first speaker said, first we're going to kill the uh, Saturday people, then we come for the Sunday people. That is what the communities of the region have been taught. And at the end of the day, I wholeheartedly agree with Ambassador David Friedman, who uh, in his latest book has said there is only one solution and that is the one state solution. If there is anything apart from the one state solution, Israel will cease to exist. Now we live in peculiar times whereby 93% of Orthodox Jews vote for President Trump and the vast majority of secular Jews vote for the Democrat Party that has become the home of institutionalized anti-Semitism. In fact, I agree with our, our former coordinator uh, against anti-Semitism. We should stop using that word. We should use the phrase Jew hatred. What we are looking at today, whether it's the BDS movement, whether it's you know the pro-Palestinian demonstrators on the streets of our campuses, this is an anti-Semitism. This is Jew hatred, and that's what we should call it. So uh, we remember those who were lost. We pray for the rescue of those who are still in captivity, the 97 who are still in captivity. But this isn't about October the 7th. This is about whether civilization will prevail over those who wish to destroy it. And I'll, I'll end on this. Of all the things President Trump has ever said, uh, and I'm biased because I, I helped frame the overall speech. I didn't write it, but Steve Bannon and myself gave it the, the, the context. The most important speech President Trump ever gave was in Warsaw at the site of the Warsaw Uprising. And in that speech, and if, if you're not familiar with it or if you've forgotten it, I highly recommend that today, later today, you go back and you watch the whole speech on, on YouTube. Near the end of the speech, as he's standing next to the statue of the 
anti-Nazi freedom fighters coming out of the sewers to, to take the war to the fascists who had taken over Warsaw. He said, the only question for us today in Western civilization is whether or not we have the strength and the willpower to fight and defeat those who wish to defeat our civilization and eradicate it. It's the only question that matters. Do we as Jews, as Christians, as members of the West have the willpower to fight and defeat those who wish to destroy our civilization? That question was true on September the 11th. It was true a year ago today, and it will always be true. And uh, my, my request to everyone out there, and I'm, I'm not trying to turn this into something political, but if we do not re-elect President Trump, it's not just the survival of the Republic. I think it is the survival of Israel that we forfeit. Thank you. Thank you so much for those important words. Thank you. Thank you. And you've been a great friend to ZOA and a great friend to the Jewish people. Dr. Gorica, very much appreciated. Um, I, one of the other things that, you know, ZOA is a nonpartisan organization, but I did want to mention at least one other um, thing that President Trump did, which ties in here, which is to recognize the legality of uh, the uh, Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria. Very, very important. I'm sure that uh, Nadia and, and uh, a member of Knesset will will agree with with agree on agree on that. Um, uh, prior to to uh, President Trump running for election, I don't know if you want to put it in. in uh, Jackie, maybe you can find it and put it in in the chat. Um, we wrote a chapter about uh, President Trump's contributions to Israel and the Jewish people, um, which also included um, cutting off the funding uh, to the Palestinians. Um, which funds a lot of their pay to slay, which Nadia referred to, which, which has been a horror paying people, and including many of the terrorists, now, now the terrorists uh, who perpetrated October 7th uh, for murdering Jews. Um, I uh, we, we have, uh, as you know, Alan Dershowitz was supposed to be here today. He may join us a little bit later. Um, he, he had a, at the last minute, he had a conflicting uh, media appearance, um, but uh, he sent us a tape. Um, so we're going to play the first few minutes, just the first few minutes of it, um, because he may join us later. And if uh, he's unable to, then we'll pay a little more of it later on. Um, as everyone knows, he's one of the country's most famous attorneys, uh, has written over 40 books. ZOA is very proud that we were, have been able to host him at the ZOA Book Club. Um, he taught at Harvard Law School for half a century. He was a longtime Democrat, and he left the uh, Democratic Party last month to become an independent. Um, we don't always agree with him on every issue. He's a little more to the left, but um, uh, we always discuss things civilly with him, which should is the way that we should do things among Jews of differing views, especially when unity and civility are so important now. Um, Jackie, could you could you play the video? The events of October seventh and eighth, and I particularly emphasize the dual events of those two days. Uh, may be as uh, transformative, symptomatic, and important to Jewish history as the events of the Evian Conference and Kristallnacht that occurred 86 years ago. Uh, we will in a month celebrate the 86th anniversary of, of Kristallnacht. What those two events showed was the depth of Jew hatred around the world. The Evian Conference infamously refused, countries all over the world, with a couple of small exceptions, refused to accept Jews from Germany and Austria who were being subjected to what eventually became a Kristallnacht a couple of months later, and then the Holocaust several years later showed the incredible depth of hatred of Jews around the world. And it also showed that Jews did not have any friends to, to count on uh, in the world. Um, what happened on October 7th was a, a surprise uh, to so many people, although Hamas had been planning it, obviously, with the knowledge of Iran 
for many, many uh, years. Uh, it should not have come as a surprise to people who have been following uh, Hamas. We know their genocidal aims. Uh, we know their goal is to end the presence of Jews in the Middle East, and if possible, in the world. Uh, let's remember what uh, Nasrallah uh, said at one point. He hoped that uh, Israel would gather all the Jews of the world, 15 million of them, uh, into one place, Israel, so that uh, Hezbollah and Israel's other enemies could dispose of them all at once, the way Hitler did to European Jewry uh, during the Holocaust. Uh, so let there be no doubt and dispute about what the, the aims and goals of Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, Iran, the Houthis, the Iraqis who are in league with them, what their goal is. It is the same goal that uh, Hitler um, had in mind, tried to accomplish and came very close to accomplishing in the late 1930s and, and 1940s. Let's remember what happened on October 8th at Harvard University. 33 student groups um, got together and blamed the rapes and the murders and the beheadings uh, on, on Israel. The National Lawyers Guild, the second largest bar association in America, justified um, what had happened. Even Professor Lawrence Tribe um, initially blamed it on, on, on Netanyahu. Um, and then on October 8th, Hezbollah. Israel hadn't fired a shot into Lebanon, hadn't attacked Hezbollah, hadn't gone after Nasrallah. Uh, Hezbollah declared war, declared war on, on Israel. And when I say Hezbollah, it's really the nation of Lebanon declared war on Israel because Hezbollah obviously controls um, Lebanon in much the way Hamas uh, controls uh, the, the Gaza Strip. And what was the world's reaction on university campuses around the world, not only in the United States, but especially disappointingly in the United States, we saw pro-Hamas demonstrations and then later pro-Hezbollah demonstrations. The media calls them pro-Palestinian demonstrations, nothing could be further from the truth. If you're pro-Palestinian, you should be anti-Hamas, anti-Hezbollah, anti-Houthi, anti-Iran. None of those organizations have done any good for uh, the Palestinian people. We can turn to quest questions now. Um, uh, you know, one of the issues, one of the causes of this um, was you know, in my, there were many causes of what happened on October 7th, and one of them uh, was the disunity in Israel. Um, there were, there was uh, these demonstrations that clogged the streets over the judicial reform issue. Um, as you may know, Mort and I uh, wrote a bit about the fact that uh, the judicial reform was needed and would help Israeli democracy, but uh, people were, you know, there's a lot of misinformation about it. People were protesting and saying it would harm d democracy, but whatever side of, of that that you were on, um, this, uh, there was a lot of civil unrest and, a, you know, there, it, it, there have been articles that say that um, Hamas saw that as a uh, weakness in Israel and encouraged them to attack. And I'm wondering if each of you could uh, briefly address um, what you see regarding a unity as being one of the possibly one of the cause disunity as being one of the causes and the importance of unity today um uh, dr gorka would, would you like to uh to go first so i say that again what was the question um it was uh about whether the disunity prior to um october 7th uh was a contributing cause and and what you see about uh, in, in your thoughts about the importance of unity today Look, I, I'm not in Israel, so I'm not, you know, really that qualified to talk about unity or disunity in, inside the nation. As an external observer who follows geopolitics, I would say that the argument over the Supreme Court of Israel was a, a key part of, of what we witnessed. The idea that just prior to October the 7th, you had 400 members of the Israeli Air Force on strike because they saw 
the prime minister's reforms as somehow undemocratic is sheer insanity. If if Tom Clancy, when he were alive, had written a book in which hundreds of members of the Israeli armed forces went on strike, you'd say this is not credible. This this is absolutely unbelievable. Or even if you even if you had a, a plot whereby you know, the Israeli Supreme Court said, well, we can just get rid of any government minister. There are no checks and balances and we run Israel. You would have likewise said that that's that's beyond credulity. So there, there were political um, factors that, to put it mildly, distracted the IDF and and the, uh, the defense forces from being ready for October the 7th or seeing uh, what was approaching. And and beyond that, and you know, he said it on my my show, America First. I asked the great Jonathan Shanza of the Foundation for the Defendants of Democracy how on earth Israel could have missed the preparation for this massive, never before seen terrorist attack. And he told me something quite stunning. He said uh, the IDF at the highest levels, has been infected with wokeness. I I served as a professor of counterterrorism in regular warfare in the Defense Department during the Obama administration. And Jonathan told me that talking to IDF generals, he witnessed exactly the same thing I saw inside the Pentagon uh, under the Obama administration, that we had the highest of highest ranking military officers in the IDF by this garbage woke crap that uh, the problem with uh, the West Bank, with Gaza, with the Palestinian Authority, it's it's not an ideological one. It's, it's not a religious one. It, it's about poverty. It's about politics. And, and, and we can solve this with negotiation. I mean, they, they they totally drunk the Kool-Aid that we had jettisoned when we came into the White House and said, that is crap. These people are teaching their children to kill Jews. It's, it's not about poverty or education. It's about culture. So the IDF at its highest levels drunk the woke Kool-Aid and as a result missed the signals. On top of that, you have this political division with regards to the Supreme Court, and it creates this concatenation, this, this witch's brew. Uh, if, if, if you talk to Jews today from Israel, it looks like they're united. I, I think, you know, what Bibi has done with the Pedro operation and with, with uh, the operations in Iran and Lebanon have, have brought in new political support. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm I'm sorry, as as somebody who's been doing ter- counterterrorism for 30 years, there is no excuse for what happened on October the 7th. Uh, there were signals, there were signs. It was a catastrophic failure of the Israeli intelligence community. Uh, why did it happen? I think we'll be examining that for decades to come. Um, thank you. Nad- Nadia, would you like to answer? Yeah, I would like to say that uh, there is unity. And uh, you shouldn't fall into the trap that the leftist media is trying to uh, uh, portray as if there is this unity here in Israel. Uh, That is, uh, and I very much agree with uh, Dr. Gorka about the uh, highest ranking uh, officials who drank the uh, woke uh, uh, drink uh, here in Israel. They drank it in America, by the way, because they were invited to come and be educated in the American uh, Academia of uh, the Military. And there they drank that woke uh, uh, poison, uh, but they don't represent the majority of the Israeli soldiers either. So uh, who are uh, proud uh, uh, and want to fight, and therefore uh, to to answer your question, um, no, it didn't happen because of the unity or disunity. The overwhelming majority of the Jewish people voted for this government, uh, want the judicial reform. Some people, of course, were maybe it wasn't done so well, but they are in favor of the judicial reform in order to. Uh, uh, enable our army to fight because the hands of our soldiers now are being tied by the Supreme Court and all those woke decisions. Uh, um, And therefore, um, what happened on October 7th was 
because of what we discussed uh, before the the dream world some uh, uh, the, the, some of our leaders uh, planted already with oslo uh, uh, in the past and the time has come now to go forward the, for the majority of the jewish people are now united in understanding who the enemy is that we need to be strong that we need to win this war that we need sovereignty and that please god will be a blessing for this new year um, as the signs say that those wonderful families, you know, that there's a, two groups of people who sprung up, uh, uh, the groups of um, parents of fallen soldiers who, despite the tragedy that they underwent, they give on the message to the government to continue to fight. And they have pictures all over Israel saying, with the death of our sons in the army, they commanded us life and victory. With their death, we they commanded us a victory. And also a group of people called Hatikva, who are parents of the um, uh, people of the hostages, who are not singing the singing the tune of the the others, uh, uh, but who are saying to the government, our our family members will be rescued and released, not through a deal. We don't want any deals where you liberate, God forbid, more terrorists, but uh, at the country with a strong military action. And those people give us strength and they show who Am Israel is and they show that we are united and please God, with God's help, we will continue to fight and we also will succeed. Amen. And we do see the unity today. And we think that's absolutely a, we do see that for sure. Um, uh, member of Knesset, Dana Luce, your, your thoughts? I completely agree with Nadia. Uh, Israel is as united as it's ever been. We uh, see that. It was even before uh, October 7th, even though we had some very strong uh, disagreements. Uh, I do want to say as a politician uh, that we politicians uh, don't always represent the unity that there is in the people. Uh, and so when you're looking from the outside and you're seeing people screaming one at the other, and you also look at the media, which is very, very divisive in Israel, then sometimes you can get the feeling that the people themselves are divided. But the people proved on October 7th that they're actually, I mean, I mean, think about it for a second. They proved left-wing and right-wing people proved that they're willing to die for each other. That That's not something small. That's something huge. Yes. They proved that they're willing to sacrifice their lives in order to protect each other. Uh, these people, by the way, Hundreds of thousands that have been on the front lines go then back to their homes. They tell their parents, their friends, their families what they've seen with their own eyes about true unity and not the BS that you see on TV. Sorry about uh, my language. Uh, and then that, that that's what actually matters for Israel because that's the unity that will stay with us uh, over time. I do believe that we as politicians, and here I'm speaking about myself first and foremost, that I do have the responsibility to try uh, and keep this unity and try to uh, speak in a way that has very strong ideas. I have my ideas and I don't plan on uh, changing them, but that presents them in a, in a way uh, which is not, uh, not aggressive to the other side, but which rather tries to convince them and unite and things like that. But that's my responsibility of, as a politician. I agree with Nadia when it comes to the actual people of Israel, they've never been as united, uh, and we see that uh, every day when soldiers really risk their lives one for the other. Yeah, we definitely see that. Um, somewhat related to that, I wanted to ask you about the pressure that the uh, current administration, some of the pressures that the current administration has put on Israel as a contributing cause and, and you know, and, and how Israel needs to stand up to that today. Um, I think about what happened in, in 2021 when Hamas shot 4,500 rockets at Israel um, and was only able to do a you know, over a course of 10 days and the Biden administration pressured Israel uh, not to not to do a, you know, to, to, to leave Gaza almost immediately before wiping out the terror threat and how that may have, you know, if, if Israel had fully gone in in 2021, uh, then you wouldn't have had October 7th. Um, and also that the Biden administration pressured uh, Israel to give work permits uh, to the Gazans. That did not happen before 2021. And those were the same work permits that were used to map out 
the uh, you know the way to the kindergartens and and, and who lived in every home and so on and, and and a lot of the information that Hamas used to plan their attack. Um, and you know today we see you know continuing pressures on Israel. Um, and this relates to a question that somebody asked uh, in the uh, in the chat about isn't this the time to go after Iran's uh, nukes uh, despite the pressures uh, from the administration? Um, and we'll do this in reverse order again. Dan, if you'd like to uh, to speak to that first. Yeah. There's a lot of different elements in what you said, and so uh, I'll tr I'll try to uh, to speak quickly about uh, each of them. Uh, but but I, I want to say this I, I I'm a little uh, worry weary uh, of uh, trying to find causes uh, for October seventh that aren't just simply the evil nature of Hamas and the fact that they're absolutely horrible people that we just have to eliminate from this planet period after we've said that that doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of things that we need to learn about how did we allow these evil people to be able to do what their evil intentions want. But I do want it to be clear that the sole responsible for October 7th the, 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 is Hamas. And uh, that that's Hamas with Iranian funding and all of their allies, right? Uh, but uh, other people might have done things by mistake, uh, right. but it wasn't their intention to see babies burnt alive and women uh, uh, raped. Uh, and so, uh, and so that is important to to say. When it comes to the specifics, I do want to say that uh, Israel has made a conscious decision not to uh, not to investigate the reasons for October seven, for the reason that we spoke about before, which is unity. Uh, not only the technical uh, unity, but I, I have to correct you right now what I said. Right now, we're not investigating right now. We will investigate because it's incredibly important to investigate in order for it not to happen again. But we're not doing it right now because we know that our soldiers right now are fighting this war, including some of the soldiers uh, that need to answer for what happened on October 7th. Uh, and we don't want them to go looking for their lawyers in order to ensure that they don't get sued or things like that. We don't want them to beat the crap out of Hamas. Sorry for my language again. But that's what we want them to do. Uh, and so we want them to focus on that uh, and not and not on other things. Now, about Iran, I do want to uh, answer that. Uh, I, I don't know what will happen. I'm not privy to that uh, higher level of security clearance. Uh, I am a, a member of the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee, but this is even uh, higher than that. But I can tell you that uh, I, uh, I do see this as an opportunity. I think that Iran, by the way, uh, at the end of the day, is the root cause of everything that we've seen from Hamas to Hezbollah to the Houthis. And instead of fighting the way that Iran wants us to fight, which is with its tentacles, it's about time that we start also hitting the head uh, and that we also let them get a, a pay a strong price. And uh, yes, the nuclear threat has become much more palpable. Imagine if October 7th would have happened when Iran has nuclear weapons, and on October 8th, it tells Israel, if you dare respond to what happened, I'll throw a nuclear bomb at you. Now, I, I honestly, I don't know what Israel would do. It, it would be a very, very strong dilemma because we know that they're crazy. Uh, we know that they're religious fanatics. Uh, we know, on the other hand, that we can't just like cow, uh, bow down to them because they have nuclear. I, I mean, it's an incredible dilemma that I hope we never get to. And we have to make everything in our power in order not to get to that. Uh, and uh, and so I think that there is an opportunity now when it comes to international legitimacy because the whole world has seen them throw these huge, massive rockets, uh, missiles, sorry, at Israel. Uh, and so we have the right to respond. Uh, and so we should respond strategically and not just in order to uh, say we responded. Thank you so much, uh, Nadia. Same question. The answer is yes. Of course, we have to uh, attack, but when and what? I'm not a military uh, um, general, so I will not go into that. I just want to say that uh, Israel was a light unto the nations up until when? The Entebbe operation. You remember with Entebbe, we went all the way to release our hostages. We did not cave in. When did everything start to... When did we bring darkness? 
with the Jibril Rajub deal in 1985, when we released hundreds and hundreds of uh, uh, murderers with three soldiers, and afterwards, of course, the Oslo Accords. And now we are, again, correcting all the mistakes we're doing by defeating the uh, enemies who attack us, by uh, not caving in, and by making sure that when they attack us, that we will give them what they deserve. And please God, while we talk now, our generals are planning what should be done. And we don't have to talk more about that. And Dr. Gorka, thank you. <laughs> so what what I'm going to say may not be popular, but but it's it's hard to, to counter it with any kind of empirical evidence to the contrary. Effective counterterrorism and and an effective counter to, to any, any enemy has to target two things at the same time. It has to counter the, tar the target enemy as capability and the will of the enemy. Mm -hmm. What Israel has been incredibly successful at in past decades is targeting the capabilities of the enemy, whether it was you know the, the famous uh, bomb maker who was originally killed by uh, explosive uh, device in his cell phone a few years ago, or whether it's it's the pager attack uh, recently, what you're doing right there is you're taking out the capability of the enemy to do you harm. But it's much more important to deal with the will of the enemy. As America lost, as America uh, learnt to its detriment in Vietnam. Uh, an enemy with with nugatory capabilities, with you know rusty thirty year old Kalashnikovs, can actually quote unquote defeat a nation with nuclear aircraft carriers. So the question is, has Israel done enough to undermine the will of those who wish to destroy Israel? I, I would say um, not enough, and 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 not yet. I, I don't think, and, and this is a rather un-American answer, because Americans think there is an answer to everything. I was born and raised in, in, in Europe, so I have a, a slightly more uh, <laughs> complex view of the world. The, the, the solution to um, the West Bank and Gaza <clears throat> is not going to be a neat one. You can't remove the population. The Arab nations of the region do not want Palestinians, quote unquote. They don't want these people. Uh, Jordan is full of them. Egypt doesn't want them. So what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to make it impossible for them to hurt you because you can't really change their culture by killing the worst of the jihadis. So it has to be a threat management approach. That's when it comes to the immediate vicinity of, of Israel. When it comes to Iran, look, um, Iran is a millennia-old civilization. It's one of the few ancient civilizations, uh, you know, Persia, not Iran. It's fascinating that if you talk to people from Iran here in America, you know, if you talk to your Uber driver and you, you, you can recognize the accent and you say, hey, where are you from, my friend? They'll never say I'm Iranian. They always say I'm Persian. So, you know, that, that's a very important distinction. And... What happens with Iran? Look, God, God bless Bibi, God bless our Jewish friends, because they will do whatever needs to be done to make sure the Shoah doesn't happen again. And if push comes to shove, they will take what action uh, needs to be taken. And let's just leave it at that. But the most beautiful solution for the regime in Iran is for the people of Persia to rise up and take it back. And when we were in the White House, it was my pr proudest moment in my professional career. The president had the cabinet arrayed in front of him in the Oval. And he called me and Steve Bannon in. He called us his heavies. He said, bring me my heavies. And we stood there next to the Resolute desk. And he, uh, he knew what he, what he'd already taken the decision, but he wanted us to, me to, you know, Steve and I to be the pitch men. And he said, okay, tell these guys why we have to kill the Obama deal, why, why the JCPO uh, deal, deal has, to, has to be destroyed. And we did our 60-second you know, elevator pitch, and we explained why it's bad for Israel, bad for America, bad for the world, 
and it doesn't stop Iran from gaining nuclear capacity. And right after that pitch, uh, against the majority of the cabinet who said, oh, you can't do that, and what will the Europeans say? President Trump pulled the plug on the JCPOA Iran deal, as he had uh, you know, every intent of doing after he was sworn in as the commander in chief. After that, we initiated the most uh, swinging series of sanctions the world had ever seen against the mullahs of Iran. And by the end of the, the, the administration, the regime was on its knees. I mean, thanks to our sanctions, uh, they, they'd lost 50, in one year, they lost 50% of the value of the stock market in Tehran. I mean, the, the regime was bled out. And if President Trump had, you know, been reelected, it would have collapsed. And the people of Persia would have taken back their nation from, from the, the murderous mullahs. So, um, as to Biden, look, let's be clear. The Democrat Party is the home of institutionalized Jew hatred in America. The idea that Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, you know, Miss BDS, uh, Miss B BDS uh, AOC is the face of the, the Democrat Party tells you everything you need to know. And if you had any question of the Jew hatred in the Democrat Party, ask Josh Shapiro. On Saturday, the video leaks congratulating Josh Shapiro on being named vice president nominee to Kamala Harris. And then he's he's not stabbed in the back. He's stabbed in the front because, you know, Minneapolis, Minnesota and all the jihadis in America uh, say you can't have a Jew as the vice president nominee for the Democrats. And then they pick, you know, Tim Wall. So um, Iran needs to be liberated by the Persians and the Democrat. And I know, you know, you're a 401c3. I get it. I'm not. I'm a former deputy of the president. Uh, if you want to save Israel, you need to get President Trump back in the White House because the Democrat Party hates the Jews. It's very simple. I mean, this isn't my opinion. Just look at Rashida Tlaib. It's all about the Benjamins. Look at uh, Ilhan Omar. The, the Jews have hypnotized the West. This is, th these, are, th these are the young, fresh faces of the Democrat Party. It's truly, truly quite stunning that that we have two parties in America and one of them hates America. I, I'll never forget. I was being walked around. I took 350 of my listeners to Israel uh, last December, ju just before so December before last. And we were being taken around by Zev Orenstein around the city of David excavations. And, and at one point, Zev says to me, Imagine being an Israeli for the last seven years, trying to deal with America. It's like you're a schizophrenic. And I had nothing to say to him because he's absolutely right. My boss goes to the Wailing Wall. My, God, my boss prayed at the Temple Wall. And now you've got people who are saying what? Ceasefire, 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 uh, as you still have hundreds of hostages in captivity after October the 7th. So the, the future of the region can only be resolved if there is leadership in the White House and the people of Persia take back their country. Thank you. And you'll, and you'll notice when they yell ceasefire, ceasefire, they're also yelling intifada, intifada. Right, from the river to the sea. <clears throat> um of a contradiction um jackie are we able to um to key up the last i know we're a little we're over time already but are we able to key up the last two minutes of uh, professor dershowitz uh video can, can, can i say one sentence till it feel uh, oh, sure sure you, you mind is that okay oh, of course not of so, course not. Uh, i want to thank well really, uh, uh professor gorka for what you said has israel done enough to destroy the will of the enemy and uh, i really think that the application of israeli sovereignty which means we are here to stay and you will never be able to have a Palestinian state, i.e. Uh, uh, is something that will definitely um, uh, um, achieve that. And I want to refer all of you to our dear friend Daniel Arbes, who wrote a very interesting uh, article. Um, Israel could become a constitutional democracy. Um, I urge you to read the article. Um, that uh, explains what Israeli sovereignty is about and that reminds us all 
that um, it will be good not only for the Jews, but also for the non-Jewish inhabitants who wants to live with us. There are Arabs who want to live under Israeli sovereignty. It's amazing, but we have to liberate them. I like what you said. We have to liberate the uh, Persians from the Ayatollah and from uh, their regime. So we have to liberate the few, not many at this time, Arabs in Judea and Samaria from the corrupt leadership, from the PA. Uh, let us remember, Abu Mazen is as bad as Sinwar, as bad as Nasrallah, and must be dealt with exactly the same way as Israel has dealt with uh, the other uh, terrorists. He's much more dangerous because he plays the so-called moderate. And uh, after we apply uh, uh, sovereignty, as Daniel Arbus says also in his article here, it, Israel will still be a democracy. Read his article uh, uh, and thank you very much. Thank you. As, and as you may know, uh, the ZOA um, for for several months had huge posters up on some of the buildings, uh, I guess, faith in Jerusalem, uh, sovereignty now, a huge yeah, absolutely. Size, building, size, building size pro, pro, you know, posters, and we can agree with you more of the necessity for sovereignty. Um, and, and that this is Jewish land, and we often write about Israel's not only God-given right to the land, but uh, legal right to the land um, under international law, um, which, you know, I, you know, I'm pleased that the, the President Trump had recognized the legality of the Jewish communities there during his term. Um, Liz, I uh, want to call your Jackie's attention that we've been joined check. by Professor Dershowitz. Oh, we are. Great. Yep. All right, so he so he can speak to us in person. Um, Professor Dershowitz, are you there? Yes, I'll need to unmute. Professor Dershowitz, could you unmute, please? Hi, hi, I'm here. Hi, hi. Oh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank we we played we played the first uh, four and a half minutes of your tape because we were hoping that you could um you you would be able to join us and and speak about what was at the end of your your tape in person about the importance of strength and. Uh, the importance of, of you know the, the what the college students have you know the, that the college students have the opportunity um, to be strong and and is real strong strength and we were we were just we were just finishing with that and I'm wondering if you could I guess give us the final words on on uh, you know your final inspiring words on being strong in these difficult times. Well, thanks. I just finished a one hour long debate <laughs> with um, a Muslim radical on the. <laughs> Morgan show, and uh, you know he attacked me, he attacked Jews, he attacked Israel, of course, and I hope I was strong in defending him. Um, I'm sure you were. <laughs> that before uh, Elie Wiesel's lessons from the Holocaust was always believe the threats of your enemies over the promises of your friends. We've been made promises by our friends; they have broken those promises. Most recently, France, uh, Canada. Uh, other countries in the world have broken their promises to uh, support um, Israel. I worry about American administrations breaking their promises to support Israel. Um, my point is that uh, when I look forward 10, 15 years, I'm 86 years old, so I'm not sure I'm going to be able to witness these points, but I think in 10 or 15 years, Israel has to be independent of all outside support. It has to be able militarily to defend itself from all enemies, uh, internal, external, terrorist, um, ballistic missiles, without counting on the support of any country. It should seek the support of the United States. It's the only country that really supports um, uh, Israel. England does not. France does not. Canada does not. Israel does at the moment, but I don't think we can count on a continuing support from Israel. Uh, various organizations like this one helps uh, us um, maintain the support of the United States. But Israel has to be prepared to go to it alone. And as I said in my uh, talk before, we have to remember the message of the of the psalm, of the psalmist who said, Hashem Ozli Amo Yitain, Hashem Yivarech Adama B'Shalom. The history of the Jewish people is that they will only have peace, only have peace through strength. They have to be qualitatively superior to all of their enemies together. If there's one lesson we learned from the Holocaust, it was it was that. And uh, as I said in my uh, recorded message as well, uh, this generation of young people is so fortunate to have the privilege, the schus, to be able to stand up for Israel with a full-throated voice and full defense 
and knowing that people who are older stand behind us. Uh, but we have to do it through strength, not through weakness, not through conciliation, not through compromise, but through absolute strength. We have to be stronger <clears throat> when Israel is concerned militarily. We have to be stronger economically. We have to be stronger intellectually. We have to be stronger morally. We have to prevail in every battleground, whether it be in the media where we're not doing such a, a great job, uh, whether it be on social media, whether it be uh, in business, uh, we have to be stronger than our enemies. Uh, we have to make it clear to our enemies that when you attack us, there will be consequences. And uh, to, um, to quote a very bad statement made by the current president of the United States, we do not respond proportionally. We must respond disproportionately. And law allows that. People misunderstand the concept of proportionality. Proportionality does not mean that if you're attacked with uh, a thousand missiles, you can only respond by attacking with a thousand missiles. If you're attacked with one missile, you can respond with 10,000 missiles as long as they're directed at military targets. The only consideration that goes into proportionality is if you're attacking a mixed target, a target that has civilians and combatants at the same time, you have to understand that the ratio of intended uh, military targets to civilian targets uh, has to be proportional. You have to understand that the number of civilians who are inevitably killed, particularly if they're being used as human shields, uh, have to be in proportion to the military value of the target. Now, for example, the military value of Nasrallah was extremely high. The military value of Iran's uh, nuclear arsenal is extremely high. And so if it requires civilian deaths to bring that about, that's permitted under the international law of war and the rules of proportionality. And so, again, uh, Israel should be strong. It should show its strength. The American Jewish community should be strong. And I have one more message, and that is, this is a message to my friends, both in Israel and in the United States. You're very divided. There are people who support one party rather than the other. There's people who support Netanyahu or oppose Netanyahu. There are people who want to focus more on return of the hostages. Others who want to return more on uh, defeating Hezbollah and, and Hamas. This is not the time for disunity. This is the time to put aside differences. This is the time to put aside, for example, judicial reform in Israel, whether you favor it or not. This is not the time to have a divisive debate. There's some suggestion that Hamas picked the time of October 7th when it felt Israel had been weakened by division over a judicial reform. We have plenty of time to debate judicial reform, plenty of time to debate electoral reform, plenty of time to debate other issues that divide the American Jewish community and the uh, Israeli communities. Plenty of time to do that. This is a time of unity. And unity means that you can't have everything you want. Unity means you don't argue now over whether there should be a two-state solution or something different. That will await the proper time. La kol zaman, says Ecclesiastes, Kohelet. And this is not the time for division. This is the time for unity. So I'm hoping that I and others can be sources of unity, can help bring together uh, different uh, groups and different ideologies within the Jewish community. Yachad, we have to stand together. We cannot be divided in the face of a seven-front war, and that doesn't even include the war we're fighting in New York City, at Columbia University, at Harvard University, and other parts of the United States, or the war in Washington. We have to remain united. Please, please, please put aside your differences, stand together, on behalf of a strong Israel. Thank, thank you very much, Alan. We actually discussed the unity issue a little bit earlier. I think I see uh, Nadia writing something. Uh, Nadia, did you want to just make a quick comment to that? Because we did, did discuss that the fact that Israel is, after, is, is who very- am I, after, you, but... uh, Who am I to speak yeah. after Alan Dershowitz just to strengthen what you just said? And there is yeah. unity. The majority of the Jewish people uh, uh, believe well. exactly in what yeah. you just said. Chazak ve'ematz, shana tova. Yes, thank you. And th th thank you, Alan, for, for all your inspiration. Thank you, Nadia, for yours and, and Dr. Gorka. 
uh, you were all just terrific panelists on, on this very momentous day. And um, I think, I, it, uh, it, Jackie, if you want to scroll the names and you know, if anybody looks, we, ha we have the, I think Jackie put in the uh, chat. Um, oh, oh, did she? Uh, the, uh, you know, where you can see the names and what happened to um, each of the victims of Hamas on October 7th and also um, the soldiers who shot, who, you know, who, you know, fought so bravely against them, often with, you know, pistols holding off uh, large uh, contingents of Hamas Nakba uh, terrorists. Um, and, and that's, if she, she doesn't have that up there, that's on the Ministry of Foreign Affairs website. Um, and, you know, if you want to read the names, just like we do on, you know, 9-11 in the United States and reading the names of the victims there, um, if you want to read those names, um, I encourage you to do so and, and to, you know, just say a prayer for the families of, of everyone who was lost. And thank you again to this fantastic panel today.